So thank you all so much for joining us. We wanna welcome you this afternoon and thank you so much for spending your time with us. This is the session on achieving true racial equity in asset management and deployment spaces. As I was reflecting on our session on how best to really sum up the reality of our sector, I remembered that during this SOCAP alone, Rachel, one of my colleagues here has actually been on two panels and another buddy of ours has been on three panels. What does that actually say about our sector and their willingness to open up these spaces to folks of color? For the four of us, this topic is not only critical to this moment, but it's absolutely critical to the impact and success that we all speak about. But no society can, ex no society can experience real impact, success, or change if it continues to silence or eliminate or disregard a majority, a major sector of that society. And as a result of our lack of equity in this space, not only do we set ourselves up to fail at our very lofty missions and visions, we miss out on the brilliance and the talent needed to tackle the global societies, to tackle global societies, our global society's most entrenched challenges. Each of our speakers today, including myself, are managing capital deployment. Today, we're gonna to look at the entire ecosystem of investment and how each of us are critical to its ultimate success. We'll take a look at traditional philanthropy, such as grants, but also impact and mission investment, who's allowed to oversee, influence, and deploy philanthropic money. We'll look at asset management and how those philanthropic dollars are actually being invested. Are they invested in a way that actually undermines the mission and vision of a foundation? And who's actually managing the funds in which we invest our dollars? Finally, as we, are we as investors even asking or consciously considering who our fund managers and owners are? And what is their motivation and intent? The common denominator, the vein of influence, management, and deployment is highly underrepresented. The most challenging aspect, I think, is the issue of power and, dare I say, fear, as it continues to fail at opening these spaces up to experts of color. So I'm gonna to turn to our speakers for their perspective, then I'll pose a few questions of my own, and then we'll open up the conversation so we can actually hear from you. And I would encourage you to begin putting your questions in the chat now. We'll capture those and we'll do have some Q&A toward the end of our session. I wanna introduce our amazing speakers. Rachel Robichotti is the founder and CEO of Odyssey Capital Asset, Cap Social Capital, an asset management firm committed to bridging financial markets and social justice. Ada Williams Prince is the senior advisor, program strategy and investment at Pivotal Ventures, an LLC who invests via traditional philanthropic tools, as well as using impact investment as a tool for change. Bayer Robinson, CEO and founder of VC Include, is a national platform that connects female and diverse fund managers to LPs that care about impact, inclusion, and innovation. And I'm your moderator, Yvonne Moore, the founder and managing director of More Philanthropy and president of More Impact. We're an advisory firm working with donors of wealth and means on maximizing their philanthropic investment both in and for communities. So now I'm excited to actually introduce you, or actually, I'll stop talking and let so that you can hear from each of these very talented and fierce women. They're going to each take a few minutes to share their critical points before we just begin our discussion. So Rachel, I'll begin with you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rachel. I was going to thank you. Appreciate it. Um, so as Yvonne said, uh, I'm Rachel Robichotti. I'm the founder and CEO of Addisina Social Capital, and we're an investment and financial activism firm. I live in San Francisco, but I was born and raised in a poor and segregated black community in rural Northern California. Um, over my lifetime, I've had three different family members murdered by the police without repercussion. Um, and fortunately, within my community, I was born um, with above average intelligence. I graded, graduated from high school when I was 15. I started my own financial firm at 25. And we've now been in existence for 16 years, but I never forgot where I came from despite now having an investment management firm that uh, manages over 150 million in assets. Um, very broadly speaking, to tell you about 
the company. We are an investment product company in the ESG, SRI, or impact universe. Um, and we say that there's kind of in any one of those, because what we really do is what we call social justice investing, which is um, not simply creating portfolios, but as Yvonne said in the introduction, serving as a bridge between public markets and social justice movements. And so the products we create have an intersectional focus on racial, gender, economic, and climate justice. And we do that work for individuals, families, foundations, um, and other institutions. And the ways that we work with social justice movements um, that are deeply embedded in impacted communities is that um, we work with them to build our investment criteria. And we also, in addition to having a very diverse team from non-traditional backgrounds in finance and partnering with um, these social justice movements, we are also doing industry campaigns um, and extensive industry education. If you've heard of the race and finance series, that's something that, that we've been putting out in finance um, to help advance these movements for social justice. Um, and uh, I can tell you a little bit more about some of our offerings. We have both a public equity strategy and an index that will be out shortly, the Addisina Social Justice Index. I hope to have good news for you about um, other things that will be coming our way in the near future, but I'm really just happy to be here and explore this particular topic. I'm excited to hear about everything you have to share, everyone. Okay, so Ada, I'll let you go next. Okay, I'm not on mute. Hi. Um, thanks for having me. I am super excited and honored to be on a panel with these brilliant folks. Not, a, not exactly sure how I finagled myself onto the panel, but here I am to talk to you a little bit about uh, where, I, where I sit. Um, I am at Pivotal Ventures, which is an investment and incubation company created by Melinda Gates to advance social progress in the U.S., enabling better lives for more people. And what that means is we support partners who are advancing progress for women and families in the US. We use both philanthropic and investment capital to fund transformational, transformational ideas, people, and organizations. So that means we're funding big, bold ideas to help accelerate the progress for women in the US by expanding their power and influence. We want more women, particularly women of color, in positions to make decisions, control resources, and shape policies and perspectives in their homes, workplaces, communities, in the world, in general. Specifically, what I work on is increasing the power and influence of women and girls of color to the benefit of all women. Why would I do that, you may ask? Uh, not just because I was born this way, but also because women and girls of color are doing invisible work holding up the economy and society. They make up 20% of the population and are still 58% of the formal caregiving workforce and 30% of the healthcare and social assistance workforce. They're on the front lines of the coronavirus pandemic, including my aunt Jean, who is a nurse. They're at greater risk to themselves and their families. The vast majority of women of color are mothers, including 81% of black mothers who are the breadwinners for their families. That includes me. And despite that inherent power and influence of women and girls of color, they're experiencing the disproportionate intersectional harms of racism and sexism. Since I'm in philanthropy, I can tell you that they receive very little investment that centers them. Of the nearly $70 billion in foundation giving in the US, only 0.5% is specifically dedicated to supporting women and girls of color. Only 0.5% is specifically dedicated to supporting women and girls of color. I'm not, I know I'm not on mute, so I know you heard that because I said it twice because it's quite important. That's $5.48, 48 cents per year for every woman and girl of color in the United States. The average grant that foundations give to organizations that work with women and girls of color is $15,000. Some of some people here at this at this uh, this conference probably make that in an, in an hour or so. So I think it's important to um, to remember, you know, even when we're talking about philanthropic giving, one of the issues 
one of the biggest issues women and girls of color face is that we're not in control of capital. Investing in women and girls of color as founders and leaders and expanding access to capital for them is the most critical way to expand their economic power. And I'm sure you all have heard this number before, but less than 1% of VC funding goes to black female founders. And if Tracy Gray is in the audience right now, she is standing up saying, I told you that 50 times. So <laughs> hopefully we will uh, remember that number. Um, but thanks, thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. I'm excited, I'm excited. Bahia, please share your thoughts. Big shout out to, to Tracy. The I know. <laughs> guy member as well. Um, so great. Well, thank you guys for having me. I'm Bahia Yasmin Robinson, um, leader, founder, CEO of VC Include. Um, I mean, I came to VC Include as a solution kind of backwards, meaning I started working with social entrepreneurs um, in a consulting role um, and ultra high net worth individuals on their portfolios um, in the 2000s. And then really started focusing on um, building eco, uh, ecosystem and infrastructure with African startups uh, in their first wave in the early 2000s, uh, 2010s. Um, I don't even know what the term for that is, but um, so in 2010, I started focusing on Africa, social enterprise. And by 2012, I was deploying capital in partnership with the World Bank and State Department, um, investing in the first generation of tech entrepreneurs across the continent. And one of the things I learned in that, both in that exercise was, you know, when you're looking at a, uh, any demographic or any region that is, you know, underserved and at where the infrastructure is, and if there is none, you have to build it, right? Um, so there was no literal or figurative, figurative um, infrastructure in Africa. So we went to not only just make the investments, but also build the ecosystem and build the infrastructure that was necessary for it to continue to grow and, to, and beyond where it is now. So we had one of the first tech hubs um, on the continent, one of the first six, and proud to say that we built a, a network of, of hubs and now there are over 600, so that kind of stuff. Really looking at um, how do you scale innovation, technology, and investment while you look at infrastructure and ecosystem. And so I started to do that, I, I pivoted a bit came back to the US and I was um, working on a project actually around Ebola, another global health pro uh, um, crisis. And it was supposed to be in New York for just a few months. And um, I realized there that New York had been transformed by the administration at the time, uh, but it looked very much like Silicon Valley. It was white men doing, you know, making a lot of money um, well networked with each other, but women and women of color were being completely left out. I had uh, a number of high growth, high potential founders that I was working with. And again, I asked where is the infrastructure and ecosystem to support mm -hmm. these best in class founders, um, did not find it. So went to, um, help several corporations and, uh, conferences and, and folks to create that infrastructure. Well, by 2017, I started working with funds. And what I realized in that first year was that when you would go to even find or source a GP with track record, that was a woman. I mean, it basically didn't exist. And, and it's a long eight months down the line. I finally found one woman with track record. I mean, eight months of, of trying to find a, a GP with experience uh, to work on a fund. And I realized that there was a big gap in the market and a huge market opportunity. I continue to poke around a bit and was asking a whole bunch of different managers um, about the pipeline that I was seeing on the ground of these, these uh, innovators, and they were all still fundraising. And so by 2018, I said, well, who's helping the fund managers fundraise and where's the ecosystem and infrastructure to actually support asset managers? Because if the asset managers aren't, the supply chain of capital is broken. If asset managers aren't capitalized to invest in the um, the solutions and the companies on the ground, especially if they know, you know, their own demographic and community needs, then it's never going to, um, you're never going to be able to grow those companies, whether you scale them as a VC, you know, with a VC model, whether it's an impact, you know, or social enterprise, really, no matter what it is, you're not going to be able to get through without some support from an asset manager that understands your value proposition and understands the, um, the challenge or solution that you have. And so started working to build this platform in, 20, in early 2018. 
uh, launched it officially in June, and for the last several years have been working to build um, a few things. One is a platform of best in class managers, making sure that you know we support fund one, fund two, and fund three. Um, women led and BIPOC fund managers through the life cycles of their of their um, funds. So we work with fund twos and we want to see them get to a four or a five, right? We work with first time managers and we're actually launching a BIPOC first time manager program here. Uh, very exciting because there's so many, there's so much new product and new managers in the space that really need to understand and be educated on how to structure, um, support, and grow their own fund and then connect with the right LPs. And so there's a lot of work to do, but we're really in the business of ecosystem building and we'll be, you know, creating a vehicle uh, at the right time as well. But this is all real infrastructure work. Maia, we're coming back to you because we want to hear more about those, all that yummy stuff that's going on. But actually, you actually, this is a perfect segue because one of the first questions I want to um, ask each of, you, each of you to kind of flesh out just a little bit of, um, a little bit more is the current state of investment, whether, you know, investment in asset management, whether it's philanthropic hybrid um, or um, impact investing. Just kind of tell us a little bit more about the state of it. Um, We'll continue to talk about the challenges. So, yeah, I'll, Rachel, I'll start with you. You all are doing some amazing things, but I know that um, I know that I've learned a lot from you and just how the sector looks and how you navigate it. So, yeah, I'll just I'll ask you to go first. It's kind of the state of the field, if you will. Sure. Um, I think that the best way to talk about the state of the field, and you know, I'm a public equities manager, so I'll kind of just keep talking about that. Um, the best way to talk about it is really in terms of um, movement. I believe that this summer changed lots of things. Um, and I believe that for, for the first time in my career, there's very real and active intent from asset owners about actually moving money and moving money to um, the black community, to BIPOC managers. And what we're running into now is what we heard of, the word that we heard, and I said this in another session this week, but the word that we heard other than racism was systemic, right, this, this summer. And so we're starting to run headlong into the systems. And so I see a lot of asset owner interest, intention, even making like statements and mandates. And we're just running into some of that same old piping inside of finance that has traditionally locked us out. And that, if anything, has become more hardened um, than it was. I don't know if we're getting farther along in the process or if it is a response uh, to more of us coming knocking at the door. But that's how I feel like that's what I feel like the state of asset management is for for folks like us. You actually began talking a little bit about the lack of deployment, but um, yeah, if you would talk a little bit about the state of the field and actually, you know, I think about how few folks of color there are in philanthropy and so therefore not influencing those dollars. But yeah, share a little bit more if you would. Right. I mean, it's 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 a little bit of, about what I said in the opening statement is there's so little investment. Um, and and it's actually what Rachel said is true in this climate right now. It's almost, uh, you know, it's almost um, bad taste to not talk about equity and what you're doing about it. Right. Like, oh, that's you know, you have to be in the now. So I think what 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 happens is talking about it and then actually putting uh BIPOC folks in charge of things is different. You can say all day that you're interested in investing in BIPOC communities, but when you get down into the weeds, right, the money that is promised, if it's not actually given, if it's not controlled or the decisions that are being made are not uh, people of color, then it continues to do the same, it goes into the same cycle that it always does. I'll tell you one of the things that's super familiar and very aligned both with philanthropy and, and investment, VC investment, is that you have um, organizations that are set up to help uh, smaller organizations get through all the financial red tape. So you have fiscal sponsors. So you could have, for example, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shout out the Collective Future Fund, which is a collaborative fund centering survivors uh, and women of color. 
they they needed a fiscal sponsor and they went to um, the Rockefeller Brothers Foundation, which is a great, wonderful shop for what they do. But when you look behind the scenes, you find out that their board of directors are all white men, except for a couple of women. So you find out that that money is going back into the system uh, to continue to perpetuate upholding uh, inequitable uh, systemic issues. So I think it's important to recognize that you can say all of these things, right? We are committed, we have so much interest. And what you said earlier, Yvonne, about like, there are five people who are on the same panels uh, all throughout this conference and other conferences that I've been to. It can be investment, it could be philanthropy, it could be, we're all the same five people. So um, I think it's the difference between what you do and what you say. And that's the state, I think, of things is everybody is saying it. Oh, one thing I'll also mention is that everybody is saying it and they're committing dollars to it. Who controls those dollars? Then when you say racial justice, it is almost a given that you're talking about black men being killed. It is not a given that you're talking about women of color and girls of color who are systematically disproportionately affected by state-sponsored violence and violence, period around the world. So this is not just in the United States. So when that happens, the only other thing you have to go to is women's rights and women's organizations, but that means white feminism. So where do we go? Where where is the where is the investment in 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 this work for for women and girls of color? And that's that's the philanthropic state of things. We still don't have the the pieces that the doing part. I'm rolling my Read. I'm rolling my no, and it's it's actually it's the reality that we have to face, and I'm I'm rolling my eyes because I do I think about um, and as Rockefeller philanthropy advisors, I don't want brothers getting mad at us. It's RPA who's actually holding that fund, and you know, with respect, it's actually frustrating when you're talking about investing in communities of color, but the partners that you find, the fiscal sponsors or however you know, you're not actually going to people who have a shared value, a shared mission, nor are you going to people who actually look like the communities that you're trying to serve. When you bring in race, you bring in class, but the reality is, is that there's no demonstrated, right? I have no problem with white partners. I have a problem when you don't share my values, right? When you don't share their values and the mission. Baya, did you want to contribute to anything? Because I definitely sure. want to talk more about behavior, but please go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I can add, you know, the the private markets and private uh, capital markets kind of perspective in terms of numbers, and they're all the same. It feels like it's all one, two, or three percent or less or point two. So, um, you know, around a, a one percent of asset managers controlling and managing the 70, 69, 70 trillion dollars of assets under management just in the U.S are women and people of color, right? So it's all kind of lumped in. And when you start breaking it out, particularly in the VC world, um, you know, the reason why a lot of black women do not receive venture capital, I think when I was really focused on it, I had helped a couple out of 30 black women, 23.5 million black women. There were about 30 that had raised more than a million dollars like a few years ago. And even if that number is 100 now, it's 100 out of, right, 23 billion. Uh, black women. And so when you start to wonder why um, that those numbers exist, it's not just because of the 1% at the total asset manager level in terms of public and private markets. It's also that in VC, there's only 0.2% of women investors, um, you know, with power in venture capital. And so you start saying, well, 0.02% of, of black women are receiving capital and 0.2% of women are even black women or women of color. Um, actually, this specific um, uh, point two is for black women are even in positions of power to invest. And so again, it kind of core, there's a correlation there. Um, you know, I, I think the partnership piece is really, um, is really important. Um, this is systemic and I think everyone from the asset manager and allocator level is looking. I mean, we get, you know, calls every day about we need to hire another, you know, investor for our team now. This is all in the last six to seven months. Two years ago, we were nice to have. Now it's like this avalanche of 
we want to partner with you. We would like, love to work with you. We know if this is needed. You know, we see these challenges. But the problem is that a lot of the training and education for those types of roles have been, you know, been excluded um, or have been barriers to entry for, you know, black women up until now. So there's this juggernaut now of we need team, we need partners, we need, and there's not a lot of, um, of, of, of folks that have the expertise. Um, I'll give one more, one last example. So we do a lot of programming, you know, we do our platform programming with managers across the asset class um, to really unpack a lot of this stuff. And we did, Rachel was on the, the panel a few weeks ago, Black Voices in Sustainable Investing. My, my company, VCI, um, uh, managed and, and curated that. And I, I put a tweet out. I said, how many Black women asset managers and allocators do you know? And I'd love to challenge everyone on this that's watching us to think, like, really on one, how many are making investment? Um, I'll tell you that we've gotten to hopefully three sessions of about four black voices and sustainability specifically for that, um, that lens. And that's, I mean, this is what I do all day, right? This has been years and years of sourcing managers and I've only been able to get a few handfuls. Um, and so all of these things need to change. It's a lot, but we, you know, we are the ones that are, that have the, uh, the knowledge share and the resources to actually support and partner with um, some of the larger asset allocators to really unpack a lot of this and to also be solutions focused. You know, Maya, you actually started answering this question. So we're all doing great work. Work the sector is actually asking for. So why is the commitment and investment to people of color so low? So I feel like um... Uh, truly what has changed is that for the first time, the asset owners really get it. I think social justice movements have um, really done a great job connecting with the public and with everyday human beings and the people who actually own the assets. What happens is that they're fighting with their financial advisors and the asset allocators um, or their program officer that's fighting with their investment committee or a CEO that's fighting with the investment committee. I mean, basically what's happening is that we have these outdated biased and overly onerous due diligence processes that orients everything in the institutions toward the idea of risk. And no one's kind of looked up and looked around the world that we're in and like, oh, those systems that we had for managing risk, those didn't really work out so well because nobody here is really happy. Um, and I just think it's important to notice that we've had these like very you know important solid unquestionable systems for managing risks that have resulted in the world that we have now so if we want a different world we're actually going to have to create different systems and i believe that due diligence and fiduciary responsibility are extremely important when you're taking care of somebody else's money but we are suffering from a severe lack of imagination and creativity I mean, track record and the particular strategy that you are serving cannot be the only way to assess whether or not, like the difference between me and someone just coming off the street randomly who's telling you that they have an investment product. Like there have to be other ways that don't systematically advantage the over 95% of the assets that are already managed by white men. So I, I think that we're used to that being the sacred cow, you know, due diligence and the fiduciary responsibility. And it's time to slaughter the sacred cow. I love the way you put that. It's so true. Uh, yeah. Don't even get me started on due diligence. No, no bad on it's, cows. I love cows, by the way, to be clear. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that's not, yeah. <laughs> but the proverbial. <laughs> Ada, Bahia, please. Why, why is the commitment to us people of color? Why is it so low? There are plenty of talented folks in the system, in the um, in the sector rather, in the ecosystem, why? Right, um, I'm a little bit hungry now because Rachel started talking about slaughtering cows, but I, I will say that, um, I mean, I want them to be cooked. I, I do want them to be cooked. I will say this, I, I, I think it's very similar in philanthropy in the sense that, um, you know, in response to deep generational and continuous damage being done, to black and brown women and uh, just families in this country, it is really not a leap of faith to place our strategies for achieving equity into the hands of black and brown women. And I think when you talk about risk, it feels like the risk is, it's such an act of courage, right? To, um, to give up control 
of assets or positions that allow for control of, of money and capital uh, to go to black and brown women. And it, for me, it's, it's, it's our best chance of eliminating all forms of direct or indirect in exclusion, right? Even as we strive forward together, you continue to leave women of color on the outside looking in. And so for me, I think it's about how how we exactly what Rachel said, how we assess risk. It's it's there's 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 nothing risky about this. Economics and the control of capital is a key seed of change. And so when you're investing in women of color leaders and founders and it, and investing in expanding their access and access to and control over capital, it's one of the most fundamental things that you can do. Um, and um, I think, yeah, about risk. And I guess the other thing I would say in philanthropy, one of the one of the things that you end up, even if, if even if foundations get it, as Rachel said, there's always a barrier. There's always another thing, another way to get over, another barrier to get over. This is all fine, but then you're you're putting money into the hands of fiscal sponsors that are not aligned. Okay, we'll give you the money, but then we will build the strategy for you. And then you can comment at the end and call it participatory grant making. I mean, one of the things that we've tried to do at Pivotal is actually assemble a body of experts with lived experience and ex deep expertise. And we're essentially bringing um, not just vital vo voices, but vital insight and expertise into building the strategy for philanthropy, for the deployment of funds, so that you are at the beginning in the design. It's like it's like bias in AI, for example, when when you don't have somebody in there that isn't a uh, part of a group, right? If you're only designing with one person, you're designing for that person. It just happens to be uh, white men, which is why you have a lot of, of great work, um, young black women who are working on facial recognition that didn't recognize women's faces. It's the same with philanthropy. It's the same with philanthropy. If you aren't actually using the expertise of women of color in your strategy, then you're not really getting at the root of the problem, which means that we just continue to put band-aids over it. There's really, um, we have data and evidence of how not risky it is to work with women and girls of color. There's data and evidence out there. Um, totally. But that's, what, that's where we are, I think. I'm just it excited to jump in. Yeah, yes, please, please. Because, you know, I mean, we, we talk about these things and obviously there's, especially at this point, we have so much data. I think when I started in 2015, that 2% of women, you know, women were getting venture capital uh, data point was just coming out. And since then, if someone asks me, where's the data, then I know that they're not really doing the work and they're not really engaged because there's so much data out there. So that's one. I think if we take a step back and really look at the two pieces or the two words or the two um, kind of parts of this discussion that are really, really integral is value and values. I think where, you know, when an allocator or even a manager will come to me and let's just stick with an allocator um, and say that they're looking to diversify their portfolio, uh, looking for new market opportunities, looking to generate alpha. Maybe this is not a philanthropic, it's more of a uh, market rate, you know, investment that they're looking for. Um, again, if they don't have any people of color on their team, then I know that the values is not aligned or not, they are not aligned. Um, and, you know, I think that, again, some of this is changing. I think people are looking at their values and also looking at uh, the fact that allocators have undervalued uh, women and people of color as asset managers for a very long time. Um, and that is creating a huge, you know, a lot of leakage in the, in the marketplace. I don't know if you guys have seen the last Bloomberg, um, article of the woman that left Citigroup and she's an economist and she, um, she had, there was a number to the, the, the $16 trillion of value that's been leaked, um, over the last, you know, decade or so of, you know, black, um, of, of, $16 trillion of value that was not captured by black communities just through a number of different, you know, financial pro pro uh, products, services, et cetera. And so um, I think that the values and the value that folks are seeing have to be aligned with 
the, the value chain of their organizations, of their investment committee, of the trustees, kind of all the way across uh, the value chain of, 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 um, of their organizations. I think that's really important. Um, <clears throat> Eddie, you actually started talking about creation. So there's so many things that you all are doing that I want to share because it's just, I mean, yet another example of the brilliance that we bring to the sector. You know, Ada, I want you to talk more about the Women's Design Council. I'm, I know I'm biased. Rachel, I want to, uh, you all to talk, um, you both to actually talk about some of the things that you were doing. You, you mentioned, a, you, you teased us a little bit by uh, in your opening comments, but then also Rachel, I want to hear more about the bond, the, you know, whatever. Um, I know that there are SEC rules involved, so I won't, um, <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble, but I'd love for you each to talk about the things that you're creating. It's just proof positive that the brilliance that the sector needs is happening, yet folks are just not paying attention to it. So I'll let you all. Rachel, you want to begin? Um, so we have a public equities uh, strategy. Um, the index will be released soon. And um, the strategy is entirely built on the idea that the social justice movements should be saying what the impact should be rather than financial analysts or other folks, um, maybe even academics. Um, we're not against academics, but they shouldn't be the single source, neither of them nor financial analysts. So for example, what that would mean is that while, while diversity, equity, and inclusion are really wonderful and we can find ways to measure for that um, in publicly traded companies, what the movement for black lives, one of our social justice partners tells us is that we really need to be focusing on mass incarceration and that before we start awarding points for diversity, equity, and inclusion, before any efforts go there, really, you know, how are the different companies we're investing in contributing to or supporting the system of mass incarceration, everything from private prisons on down to surveillance. So it's it's just that matter of changing, like, who has control, as Ada's been talking about, like, who has control and it took a firm by a black woman to look around and say, wait a minute, when they're talking about, you know, in the Me Too, um, in the Me Too movement, they're talking about serial sex or harassment. Why is the industry creating gender lens funds that are all based on how many women are on the boards? That Those two things don't have anything to do with one another. I think sitting outside of the traditional power structures gives me and other women of color an opportunity to kind of just look very clearly at what's not working and, and come up with more interesting solutions. On the bond side of things, um, we have a new, uh, we call it a fiscal justice strategy that really is about directly investing in black communities across the United States via the municipal bond markets and working directly with black communities on certain measures of fiscal justice um, to ensure that like if you're investing in these municipal bonds that it's actually doing something to improve like the health and wealth outcomes of the black people directly in that community and again people have wanted to do something about racial justice for a really long time but an all black portfolio management team comes up with something that has a real and palpable impact and something that's never been done before. You're muted. I think she's calling on you, Bahia. I wanted to find out if you wanted to share more. I forgot I was muted. Sure, yeah. About I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. So again, you know, we're we're really in the business of creating, you know, in infrastructure and to support and grow best in class PAC and women led fund managers starting um, we call the sustainability and innovation cap starts uh, with VC and impact investments. Um, and so we've worked with uh, 30 funds um, in those two spaces and those two asset classes uh, represent, representing over a billion dollars in AUM just to date in the last couple of years. Um, we have a pipeline of 5 billion more um, in capital with and want to expand our pipeline and our platform uh, to be able to connect those asset managers to LPs and asset allocators that are ready to write checks and deploy capital to um, some of those funds. And so, um, so there's a platform piece and then there's kind of the training and education piece. And as I mentioned about the BIPOC first time fund manager, we're excited to uh, to work with our partners to launch that in Q1. And that's going to provide training and education to first time managers, kind of infrastructure, you know, uh, back office, et cetera, 
uh, training and education and insights so that they can build their first time funds in a way that's attractive and, uh, and ensures long term growth. Um, over the life cycle of their funds. And then the last piece um, that you asked about is the vehicle that we are um, exploring with the number of LPs to then be able to deploy capital um, to some of the managers that we have already sourced and screened. Um, because what we're seeing is again, this kind of juggernaut between um, a lot of asset allocators that don't have the internal capacity, don't have any representation of a lot of these um, BIPOC or women-led investors in their um, investment committees or in their on their boards. And so, you know, there's a lot of we want to do this stuff, but as Rachel and, and, and everyone else on the panel has mentioned, you know, there's not either sign off or they have to figure out what the strategy is, then hire for it. And then so now you're thinking about oh, that's a year or two out or maybe even three years out. And even with the um, accelerated timeline, that's still, I mean, we're in COVID, right? We're in uh, we are in a pandemic and there are funds now that are fundraising that for the fund twos and fund threes on our platform, on the platform side, already have top quartile or top decile return profiles. So they're already um, ready to deploy capital, have already identified portfolio companies that are you know, looking to grow now. And so we're really trying to create efficiencies in the market. Um, and that's it's through those three strategies. This is so exciting. And Ada, so um, not to put you on the spot, but I'm, I guess I'm putting everybody on the spot. So I've been in philanthropy for 21 years and direct services before that. And I, I, I think Ada understands how powerful the work that she's doing is. I mean, she's engaging women of color around a women of color strategy. Who would have thunk it? What an idea to actually talk to the people with whom, to whom you want to serve. But she's doing it on the front end. So if you would share as much as you can about the design council you know, actually involving people in your giving strategy that will be impacted by that strategy. Yes, and this is actually uh, very specifically focused on the women power and influence strategy that Pivotal Ventures and Melinda Gates launched last year in September, where it talks about how how do you get to gender parity if you're not willing to bend the curve on all of the different ways that women and particularly women of color are on this plot. And if we keep doing what we've been doing, we will not get to gender parity for 208 years. I don't know about you, but I really don't have that kind of time, um, especially right now it, during the pandemic. So what we decided to do, because we know that 40% of all women in the United States are women of color, we realized that you actually have to have a strategy that is both uh, unique and targeted towards women and girls of color in order to, to, um, to have an impact. And so we built the Women of Color Design Council and it's comprised of expert philanthropists, social change activists and investment leaders charged with shaping pivotal strategy for advancing women's power and influence by eliminating barriers for women of color's full participation and infusing total equity into the fields we are aiming to disrupt. So that means we got these folks together and these are the, 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 best, the best minds, um, Yvonne is included as she is my co-chair. And we decided that actually we, we can build pathways to the power and influence for women of color through philanthropic investment and incubation. So we're bringing those voices in from the outside to help infuse our strategy, right? Um, and these are all to solutions and systemic problems that we're trying to we're trying to address. But um, I will say that it's it's a hard thing for for philanthropy to do. We there are all different kinds of like community foundations actually do this work when they um, work with communities to figure out like different committees on how uh, they should be deploying funds. But in private philanthropy, this is the first kind of thing where you actually have a group of women of color who are directly involved or uh, or just basically a part of the problem um, and really concerned with building its solution. I don't know of a place right now uh, where you have a foundation that will let that will give up power or share power with women of color to build their strategy and then say, we will deploy the money in the way that you suggest. 
So I think the, I mean, the work of the of this council can be kind of like falsely seen as this internal audit or like this public facing statement project aimed at conveying our commitment to racial equity, but that would be a mistake. This de design council actually represents a bold innovation by a uniquely unrestrained and agile organization. So we're acknowledging our blind spots and establishing a structure free from the constraints of our institutional power structure, but endowed with this access and authority built to eliminate them. So this is a real like moment, I think, for us to, to try this out. And when it's fully integrated into the whole organization, it has the potential to not only add a powerful new dimension to Pivotal, Pivotal's work and Melinda's legacy, but as a test model and as a great way for other powerful players in philanthropy and investment and social change leadership to actually build from. So um, I'm hoping that what you sense from this panel and this brilliance um, that's both tactical and practical um, that you see that um, what we're doing is 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 not disruption. It is the natural order of how things should be. Um, it's not risky. It is what it should be because we're missing out on design innovation. We're missing out on more money. We're missing out on more access. We're missing out on a better economy if we aren't doing things like this. So that's the hardest part of driving meaningful systemic change, especially when it comes to dismantling racism, is asking those with power to relinquish it yeah. and to work together and to, you know, not just power in the sense of wielding resources or leverage, but power in the sense of planning and decision making. So I'll stop there. Also, I want to apologize for several animals coming into my screen. This is why Austin does not have Zoom, so. Yeah. You don't have I don't, a big background. I just have to apologize for my bedspread. I just want to put that out there. I don't even know why people <laughs> worry anymore. It's like we're nine or ten months in. We are working from home. It actually relieves some of the pressure. The puppy dog. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. the kitty cat. Oh, Love like no. Yeah. You know what? I there judgment free zone. So that's yeah, actually that's a perfect good. setup for my last question because we've got some good questions from the audience. So I want to get to them in a few minutes. But um, that was a good segue, Ada, into you all keep setting me up. Thank you. So what are ways this community, philanthropy, investment, impact investment, asset management, can lead the way, right? So, and, and this is not something that you all haven't already talked about, but talk to folks about how their daily practices might actually be contributing to the problem. Because I think sometimes people think, well, we do this and we do that, but actually that's a problem. So maybe something that yeah. folks, yeah, Rachel, please. I would love that. I have two suggestions. Um, and I know I love to put suggestions out there that are like the moonshot and, you know, people can do something less than that, but still get us on our way. I want to abolish the RFP or at least the RFP or RFI is something that you expect us to fill out because I have a 12 person team. It takes everyone on our team to fill out the 300 question, 28 page RFI or RFP in order to be included. And that inherently has right this structural piece built in that means like I can only do so many of those and actually get the work done in the world that we're up to. Um, so that's what I like that's a very specific idea or self complete them or come to these panels and understand what it is that we're working on right and definitely do the due diligence um, but take on more of that burden um, yourselves if you're in an asset allocation position. And I believe that that is only appropriate because we are no longer in a situation where there are many people offering the solution to what you're seeking. There are not a few institutions and lots of asset managers. If you're looking for women of color, specifically BIPOC folks, and they're actually focused on justice and sustainability, there's a handful of us and we do not have time to go through these processes if we're actually out there doing that particular work. So I think where there are resources and time for that onus to switch back in the other direction, specifically because an application process is intended to have us compete against to have like the different off people who would offer the service compete against one another and that's not actually what you want from us we actually want more of us in the field um, i also would say 
stop using assets under management as a proxy for financial stability um, and institutional sustainability. It requires that you already have personal networks, family, money, or are basically 150 um, by the time if you're a black person to have like the adequate assets under management. Um, because in the end, the true risk, for example, if you're a public equities manager, is that the individual assets, the individual get distributed to the asset owners, right? If we go under, you still have those particular securities. It's very similar in a G, in an um, LP situation where it may be an administrative burden and you might lose some of like the technical assistance right to the underlying portfolio companies, but the economic ownership would actually shift. And so I just wanna get us back to like, what is it we're really trying to solve for and how are there these very specific ways that we've institutionally kept folks out who don't historically have the assets and resources to effectively compete? Ada, how are folks contributing to the problem? What are some... Uh, I, I, <laughs> yeah, I think Rachel uh, did a good job, but he as well. I think that that there's a lot of suggestions in what we've been saying, but I, one of the key ones is this idea of honor multiple ways of knowing, right? There is there is not one way of knowing, and I think if you center the one way, that one way will be white supremacy and white dominant culture and racism and sexism and all the systems that um, that that plague our system right now. So I think listening, actually listening, but then doing, right? You can incorporate data into, we are, we're planning to incorporate data into our strategy, but we're also, there's limitations to the data that is available on women and girls of color and their experiences. So we're prioritizing lived experience to guide us on what we focus on first. The other thing I think it's particularly important to hear is that, um, when we're working around communities of color, there are both interconnected issues that cannot be tackled in silos. We do not live single issue lives. Therefore, what we tackle cannot be single issue. It is okay that somebody who works on economics can also work on housing or something else. There, there's, there's not one way. It actually contributes to the barriers in our day to day and never actually getting to the root causes and the solution. So those are the two things I would say. Honor multiple ways of knowing, um, deep listening than doing, not just listening. And then recognizing that nothing is a single issue when we're talking about communities of color because we've all had to manage. So we've all figured out how to do intersectional work. Uh, and that's all we know how to do. So uh, those are the things I would say, um, and also that hop in should get backgrounds. <clears throat> <laughs> Another solution. <laughs> hop in should get virtual backgrounds. <laughs> if no one understood that, and someone loves seeing your dog, Ada, just so you know, they made a, a comment. Bye, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I mean, just to keep on the solutions track, um, and I'll be very, very specific here. Obviously, we're broad because we're infrastructure and ecosystem, but you know, two really powerful ways that as asset allocators could make an a, you know incredible um, progress in the space is to invest and anchor Black women asset managers, and to invest and anchor Black women um, impact investors. Because again, think about think about how many you know. Think about how many are capitalized. Um, I know the number, and you know it's less than this. Um, but but you know, challenge yourself to think about what that could look like. Um, and and you know, feel free to reach out to us to to support you in the journey. But um, you know, I think we have enough solutions that we've offered that that folks just need to you know take action. This is so great. Okay, we got a few questions. Um, oh, Dr. Marcel, I saw her just pop in. Um, so here's the first question. I heard earlier in the week that 95% or more of capital investment is deployed to white folks in this country. And I'm from the South, so I say folks, they said people. How can we change that? Solutions for that. Oh, see, I'm so stressed about the questions. All right, did everybody, I hope everyone heard that. I hope everyone heard that. Yeah, yeah, it, it, I mean, I think they were saying here that investing in, investing and anchoring, putting capital 
that's actual capital into the hands of women of color is what yeah. will change. Exactly. And that is what you could walk away here and do. Actually, you could do it right now. I'm sure you could get Absolutely. on the phone and do it right now. So I think that is like the central theme of this panel that I didn't yes. know I should be on. But I think I now see you the central theme here is capital. Clearly, women. and I just had a double moment because that was my question, wasn't it? How can it change? <laughs> Okay, so I, I, I'm guilty of being a little bit nervous. Actually, Rachel, someone had a question, and I know that you've been trying to respond in the chat. Someone right. had a question. No, yeah. actually, you've been doing pretty good. Someone had a question about your thoughts on the prison free fund mm -hmm. screen that you've developed. It, did you? Did oh, you no, we didn't develop that? that. Yeah, as you so developed it, but they used um, a lot that we, we had a lot of input in that. And I also put in the chat. Um, the uh, I also put in the chat our racial justice exclusion list, which has been covered in the New York Times, Bloomberg, Financial Times, um, and has wide adoption across the industry because it reflects the views of so many communities of color. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Now, Rachel, so again, you've been active in the chat, um, which I'm highly impressed. Did you, um, so I love the, the question about shareholder advocacy because that's actually one of the things that came up Yesterday, actually, the conversation that Darren Walker had with Sir Richard Cohen um, was that share as shareholders, investors who I, I'm pretty sure that all of us are ourselves, we're actually not active shareholders. And so one of the questions that came up, um, Rachel, it's also true that social the social justice movement has had a strong voice in the shareholder advocacy world for decades. How will your equity and bond strategies coordinate with these existing coalitions? Part two, how do you see innovating and moving beyond them. So we already, we are the primary staffers of the Racial Justice Investing Coalition, which is a multi-billion dollar coalition, mostly in the public equities market. And we work with uh, closely with a lot of the members there. Um, in fact, the one of the founders is actually on staff at our firm. We really believe in shareholder advocacy. Um, it does have inherently a limitation and you are, and I think it was Lisa Cooper, you're correct that there's a lot of uh, coordination with social justice movements, the folks that are doing that work. But when we get down to the actual, like what is it that we are saying as a data point is a proxy for a good workplace for women? What is it as a data point that we are saying as a proxy in terms of what's good for black folks? When we get to those levels, that's when we start impacting portfolios that are well beyond whatever's happening, right, in our particular strategy. When we get down to like the impact metric and the data level and we start organizing other investors. So it really allows the scope to go beyond one's own portfolio to truly become large and systemic, which are the kinds of solutions that we need at this point. And so, I mean, what that means is that we're working on companies even like we actually care if right if Exxon who would never necessarily be in our portfolio has a forced arbitration for sexual harassment clause like we actually care and do work in that area too because we're trying to affect large-scale systemic change for those who are most impacted by these issues so um, I think that we are moving beyond them and also coordinating with them because we have to push on these companies at all sides yes the shareholders have to do the work but also you know, when people are evaluating whether a company is good for women or good for black folks, like we need to make sure they're evaluating the right data point. Excellent. Okay. Um, I'm going to read this question out. It's, 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 it, it, Tracy Gray. I, um, you know, she yeah. always brings it. Did you see that one by you? Okay. Yeah. So I'll jump in really quickly. I know we have two minutes, but yeah. yeah. And, um, let her know, let them know what the question was too. And you can just respond to it. Tracy's question was, um, have I, or have we, I think it was for me, experienced allocators telling fund managers um, that BIPOC uh, fund managers should do racial equity investing or asking what the racial strategy is? Yes. So I definitely, particularly after, right after George Floyd, it's continuing to happen, but I've kind of pushed some people um, off of this topic, which is, you know, well, you have all these diverse managers on this platform, but are they just focused on diversity? And it's really a, a it's a, uh, you know, I would say to be harsh, disrespectful, but I think it's, I think it's because again, eyes are open and it's like, oh, well, every black or brown or Latinx or woman investor must be only investing, uh, you know, for racial equity. And, um, 
what I'll tell you is that all of our diverse managers, uh, whether they're women, uh, Black, Latinx, BIPOC managers, naturally have at the minimum 30 to 50% of their portfolio companies are diverse or have diverse teams, including people that look like them on the um, in, as co-founders or the executive teams. Um, but to, to insist that a BIPOC fund manager only invest in BIPOC uh, portfolio companies is just, it's a little bit insulting. So one thing that we probably shouldn't do is ask those questions. Um, I think a deeper, deeper dive. Now, there are some BIPOC fund managers that have a strategy that's specific to a particular demographic, and those are all needed. The thing is that the whole spectrum is needed. You can't just say it's only this. What we're talking about is the system and is making sure that the whole system is nourished and that everyone's generating alpha and generating GDP and growing and evolving the economy because we're including voices and folks that are creating value in the world. All right, 20 seconds, each of you. What if? What do you want folks to leave with? Um, Ada, don't forget this one thing. <laughs> Change philanthropy by investing in women and girls of color. Rachel. Get involved in your investment committee or due diligence process. People who are coming to sessions like this in those spaces, and usually they are not overlapping. Bahia. Empower BIPOC asset allocators and invest and anchor into BIPOC fund managers. Today. Excellent. I would encourage you all to go to the BISBO and find these ladies, their profiles, their work. Um, email me if you can get a hold of them. And thank you all so, so very much for joining us. Thanks to my beautiful, beautiful thank panel. You thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Yesterday. Bye bye. Bye now.